I am Alex Tegelar, and this video is titled Queer and Trans Performance Strategies in Contemporary Canadian Theater and Performance. I am an MA student at Brock University in Studies in Comparative Literature and Art, and I am the co-artistic director of the cabaret theater company, Operation Snatch. Writing for, casting, and working alongside transgender and queer people has been a calculated choice in my life as a theater creator for over 15 years. When you are entrenched in artistic, political, and social spaces with people who embody gender and sexuality in a manner that is understood as both adaptable and yet profoundly conscientious, the script, quite literally, gets flipped. What can we learn about role-playing and performativity, that is to say the everyday performance of gender, from those who are often coerced into so-called normal gender expressions in their day-to-day -to, -day to avoid everything from awkward gendered social interactions to traumatic verbal and physical violence? And how can we create space for their real stories to unfold? What can we learn from people who are burdened with the contempt that is heaped on those perceived as trying to pass, as though we are all not constantly composing, and amending, and updating our identities for myriad reasons? Anyone who inhabits a body that is criminalized and stigmatized is, by definition, a good actor. That doesn't necessarily mean they want to be on stage, but... I challenge you to find a transgender or queer person who doesn't know how to perform, who hasn't acted out great portions of their life to survive, including in spaces that resolutely define themselves as welcoming of diversity. I will begin by saying that when I use the term transgender, I cannot hope to encompass in a short video all that means to everyone who is transgender or transsexual or gender non-conforming, and I offer this same caveat when I use the term queer. With this in mind, and with suggestions for additional reading throughout and resources posted on this page, I will be talking a little bit today, not only about the value of working with transgender and queer performers, but also about the value of using transgender and queer methodologies in theater and performance. By employing people in tactics that challenge established theatrical motifs, we open ourselves to the nuances we strive for when producing compelling theater. When I create theater with transgender and queer actors, First and foremost, I wish to avoid what I call the paraprosdokian device. A paraprosdokian is a rhetorical expression in which the second part of a sentence or phrase is surprising or unanticipated in a way that causes the reader or listener to reinterpret the first part. It's, it's frequently used for humorous or dramatic effect. The late comedian Mitch Hedberg was known for his skillful use of paraprosdokians. For example, uh, I used to do drugs. I still do, but I used to, too. Groucho Marx was also a master of the paraprosdokian. I've had a wonderful evening, but this wasn't it. Do you see how you reinterpret the first part of the sentence when the second defies your expectations? Trans and queer characters are frequently used in performances paraprosdokian devices to defy expectations, but also to defy as a means of trickery their place in the carefully structured gender order. This strategy is known among some transgender scholars and performers as the reveal. Danielle M. Said defines it as the moment in a trans person's life when the trans person is subjected to the pressures of a pervasive gender sex system that seeks to make public the truth of the trans person's gender and sex body. Now, the thing that really defines a paraprosdokian is that the cliché is usually embedded in the first part of the sentence or phrase, and the surprise is embedded in the second part. In the paraprosdokian about having a wonderful evening, for example, the reveal happens in the second part of the sentence when we learn that Groucho has had wonderful evenings, but the one to which he is currently referring is not one of them. 
when one subjects transgender or queer characters to this tactic, one can be sure that the cliche is always occurring in the second part and that for trans and queer actors and theater creators who wish to explore issues beyond, you know, genital and sexual orientation panic, this is naturally very frustrating and dull. As transgender cabaret theater creator Annie Danger says, the joke is, <laughs> it's not a joke. In theater practice, the concept of the reveal is an important plot device, to be sure, but, um, well, to give you an idea of how this might play out in relation to a heterosexual cisgender character, it would be like perpetually being forced to answer the question, when did you know you were straight? And expecting the answer to this to absolutely stun the audience and transform the direction of the play. Or perhaps a, a character is forced to concede over and over and over that they are deliberately hiding something that would compromise the comfort and safety of everyone around them and that something might be as mundane as the length of their earlobes. Transgender people are forced, as scholar Julia Serrano argues, to be stuck like broken records in what is often just a fragment of their lives. One can only imagine how tiresome this would be to have corrective or enhancement surgery and to be obliged to have a reckoning with it at every, any given moment that implies you're a fraud and a potentially hostile one at that. In 2007, my company produced a show called Who's Your Data? We explored the paraprosdokian device in a scene that was meant to mimic the style and quality of a feminine hygiene advertisement from the 1970s. Two cisgender female dancers performed in a lyrical style and gauzy negligees while a transgender actor stripped to reveal flowers in his bra, which when he stood in front of a fan, flew up in the air romantically and most importantly, non-threateningly revealing the scars from his chest reconstruction surgery. We turned this moment, which everyone waits for on tenterhooks, into a tampon ad from the 1970s, equating the big, shameful secret foisted on trans people with the big, shameful secret foisted on menstruating women. The fact that someone's genitals or secondary sex characteristics are not what we expect them to look like, and yet we demand to see them slash not see them, is as commonplace as having a period. And yet so much drama and contrition is demanded from those who don't actually experience these things. Unsurprisingly, Transgender and queer depictions are already beginning to look like the racism that continues to play out in performance spaces and texts, whether in racial stereotypes or in the showcasing of what can be called the white savior complex. Please see Michael and Nayla's videos in this series for more explorations of racism in performance. Being aware that transgender and queer performers may be engaging in what Gayatri Spivak calls strategic essentialism, that is to say, playing to stereotypes in order to increase and improve general trans and queer visibility and, and gain access to performance spaces, is important to take into account. A good question to ask ourselves in relation to the trans or queer performer as potential paraprosdokian device is this. Where are we acquiring our perceptions of queer and trans lives? I can tell you with certainty that these readings are often simulacra, depictions based on depictions that are false to begin with, grounded in discredited medical or psychological analyses, or even pulp fiction representations. These readings which are mobilized over and over by the mainstream media and entertainment industries, rely on framing trans and queer bodies as disingenuous, pathologized, or dysphoric. These faulty diagnoses inevitably result in characters who are homicidal, covetous, and filled with rage, such as in the films Dress to Kill, and the silence of the lambs, or in characters who ruin people's lives by not broadcasting the contents of their trousers immediately and are themselves subject to the rage that 
naturally comes with this terrible, terrible ruse. Now, it may seem interesting to place trans and queer bodies in these roles to create dramatic tension, but when we engage these shot-born tactics, we are letting people know, to paraphrase Bell Hooks in her retort to people who say she's not like those other feminists, that everything we know about transgender and queer bodies comes into our lives third hand, that we have really not come close enough to transgender and queer people to know what really happens in their lives and what they are really all about, and most disconcertingly from a creative standpoint, that we do not care to challenge and revise our precious artistic histories to include or reveal more complex representations of transgender and queer people that may have been in the texts to begin with. As Susan Stryker says, kick over any rock and you will find a trans story under it. People think of transgender, transsexual, and gender variant stuff as being so exotic or marginal or hard to find, but once you start looking, we really are everywhere. Now, if we learn anything from transgender and queer bodies, it's that revisions are not only possible, but they often vividly enhance the original work. It may be difficult to accept that our ideas of transgender and queer bodies are informed primarily by pathologization. It may, to borrow from T.L. Cowan's theory of the trans-feminist killjoy, spoil feelings of political and social well-being or pleasure that are contingent upon the tacit agreement of trans people to be tokenized in creative spaces. But the fact is, the first non-medical journal of transgender studies, Transgender Studies Quarterly, was only published in 2014. We must understand that by continuing to mobilize cliches, we are creating stories based on histories that have harmed transgender and queer people immeasurably. When Annie Danger was asked what she wanted to express publicly in relation to queer sexual desire, she said healing. Healing. Let's think about that when we make theater with, for, and by transgender and queer people. Are we exploiting the concept of dysphoria, so a pathologized and medicalized state of distress, when we engage with transgender and queer bodies on stage? Are we placing the trans or queer body in a dysphoric capacity, in a state of perpetual imminence? When I talk about imminence here, I'm referring to Beauvoir's definition. She posits that women are in a perpetual state of interiority, passivity, and inertia, imminence, while men are active and powerful and creative, permitted to reach transcendence in the patriarchal systems that privilege their opinions and stories. Are we placing trans people in a perpetual state of imminence, never permitting them to cross over to transcendence because of the structures that keep them trans and trans only, always in their transition, never transitioned? Are we gatekeeping? Are we using the trans body as an axis upon which to turn out our own anxieties about our gender and sexual expression? Questioning these issues should make us question all the ways in which we profit artistically off the pathologization of othered bodies, such as those as sex workers, racialized people, and people with disabilities. Transgender and queer bodies cannot continue to exist in a holding pattern of objection, difference, and repetition. When we demand greater social and creative recognition for sexual and gender expression, it benefits us all. Diversity lifts all of us. And to be perfectly blunt, as a cabaret theater producer, I am often working with a budget of two nickels and a paper clip, maybe a potato. To have a cast of performers who are capable of embodying a range of gender and sex expressions on stage rather seamlessly is liberating both artistically and financially. As theater creators, 
we strive for a more nuanced and exciting interpretation of the world. Queer and trans methodologies don't just allow for this, they are this. As David J. Getsey writes, once gender is understood to be temporal, successive, or transformable, all accounts of human lives look different and more complex.